So I'm going to talk about um, kind of smart development cloud as, as a topic. What, what we do at Electric Cloud, I mean, it's a little bit strange to have a guy from a commercial software company showing up in, a, in an open source type conference. But um, we work a lot with our customers to basically put their workload into the cloud. And, and typically with, with our customers, it tends to be private clouds. Um, you know, they tend to be large enterprise companies. They're a little bit skittish about public clouds. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to get into this notion of hybrid clouds and, and sort of private hosted clouds and all of those kinds of things. Um, but, but it's been kind of an interesting, um, interesting kind, of, kind of work that we've been doing for the last few years with these guys. And, and really, I mean, it's driven by a bunch of different things. So development processes are complex and, you know, lots of heads are going to nod here because I don't think there's anything I'm, I'm saying here that anybody uh, hasn't heard before. But we've got lots of different teams that are involved, lots of different stakeholders. You know, there's more platforms now than there used to be. Um, you know, every single phone, every single, you know, every single watch has its own uh, operating system and somebody writes software for that. Um, there's way more tools uh, that are out there than there used to be. You know, the cost of distribution uh, for software has essentially gone to zero with everything being over the internet. So there's lots more, you know, so the barrier to entry is so low. There's lots of really good tools out there now that, that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. And, and a lot of these companies, and a lot of these organizations are global. They're all over the place. So you're, you're managing you know, multiple teams, multiple styles, multiple tool sets, multiple you know, approaches to doing things. And, and, and at the same time, there's this kind of ground shift on, on the IT side of things where, where everything is moving into the cloud. Um, and I think the cloud is kind of a funny thing because I don't think of cloud as a thing. I think about it as a how. You know, it has to do with, you know, Flexible resource allocation. It has to do with automation. It has to do with you know thinking about things at scale uh, and, and and those kinds of things. I don't really think about it as a place, uh, much though I'm sure every cloud vendor would want us to think about it that way. But the complexity of all of this stuff is increasing because at the same time there's kind of a groundswell in the development community around practices like agile. And you know if you if you know anything about agile, one thing you know is you do a lot more. And you do it a lot more frequently when it comes to doing builds, tests, deploys, uh, all of those kinds of things. So whatever you used to do before, you know, when you were very proud that you had a nightly build and nightly test suite and all that kind of stuff, well, I mean, guess what? That's, you know, you're cranking continuously now. And being able to, to, to take advantage of cloud technologies to, to accelerate those processes, to make them easier to manage, all of those kinds of things is, uh, is something that a lot of the, uh, the larger software companies uh, or start to work on, or I should say larger companies that write software. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that, you know, like GM, for example, that, you know, you wouldn't consider a software company, and yet there's like 38 microprocessors in the latest Chevy Malibu or something like that. Um, and, and sort of the, the traditional software process is, is, is complex, you know. This is an actual kind of workflow from, from one of our customers in terms of, you know, how they take their code through, you know, a certain... Uh, kind of integration pipeline all the way out, all the way out through QA and production, and all the little exceptions and, and, and things like that. And, and an interesting thing about um, sort of a difference between putting development into the cloud versus putting, say, ops type stuff into the cloud is when you're doing things with development and testing and so on, you're actually trying to break things. You know, you're 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 you need to you know you need to expect that almost every single time you do something, it's going to break. Otherwise, why are you bothering to do it? Um, Doing, doing things on the op side, you're a little bit kind of on the opposite of, uh, of that coin and trying to say, well, I don't want it to break. You know, I'm going to monitor, I'm going to you know, do all these things so that when it does break, I can figure it out. But more so than anything else, when you're doing build, test, deploy, you really are you know, looking for failure as a very, very common option. And you need to kind of plan for that. And so at the same time, we, you know, we're, trying to, we're trying to change and be more agile, trying to do everything you know, more quickly, try to... Uh, you know, try to do all of this, uh, you know, all of this stuff at, at, at light speed. And yet, you know, we're still kind of in the dark ages in terms of software production. You know, we're, we're really, you know, we're, there's a wiki page at best, you know, on how to do things. Or maybe there's a bash script. Or maybe it works if you run it on this machine, but maybe it works, it doesn't work as well on this other machine. And, you know, everything is kind of, you know, everything is kind of out there and distributed. And there's no closed loop on kind of measuring any of the, uh, you know, the things that you care to measure. Um, and, and then at the same time, you know, we've kind of got this, you know, CIO somewhere in the company saying, oh, I need a cloud strategy. You know, what's my cloud strategy? Well, a lot of times what ends up happening is it's development. It's, it's dev and test that ends up being the first candidate, you know, for, for being moved into the cloud uh, inside of these companies. 
And it sort of makes sense, right? Because you need, you know, if you're a development organization, you need access to lots of different systems. You need to scale because you're going to grow, and you need, you know, really elastic assignments or uh, assignment of, of resources because, you know, right before a milestone, you're going to be doing lots more build, test, deploy cycles than you are going to do, you know, the week after that. And so that 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 sort of makes dev an ideal customer, you know, for for cloud type computing. Now again, a lot of the time, you know, with our customers, we're, we're dealing often with kind of private cloud type type situations. We're really just kind of virtualization infrastructure is what it ends up being a lot of the time. But there isn't that much difference, you know, to, to go to that, you know, sort of next step and say, well, let's push it out into EC2 as well. You have to do, you know, much of, uh, much of, the, same, much of the same work. So, you know, why do they want to do this? You know, blah, 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 goodness, apple pie, you know, less, less work, more pay, I think is basically what, what that comes down to. Um, now, here's kind of the challenge, though. So from, from the dev side of, of, of the house, you know, what do I want? You know, I want my productivity to go up. I want my developers to be happy. I want their builds to be fast. I want their test runs to be fast. You know, I want them to be able to deploy into as near a production environment as is possible when we're doing this testing. Um, you know, I want all of these things, and I want them now. Um, you know, IT, on the other hand, has, has you know, kind of a, a, an approach of, well, look, we're, we care about utilization. We care about cost. You know, all of these kinds of things. And, and there's a little bit of a mismatch, and it makes it a little bit difficult sometimes uh, because these two organizations would sort of appear to have, have mismatched goals. It isn't necessarily that bad, though. But, but you know, if you kind of look at it in terms of the, the, the problem spaces, right, what's IT going for? IT is going for utilization, security, stability, all of those things, right? I want 100 identical of these things, you know, and that way I, I don't have to worry about spare parts. I don't have to worry about management and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, Dev, on the other hand, you know, when, when I'm writing code, I want two of everything. And I want complete control over it. I need the root password. I need to be domain admin. I need all of these things because I need to install file systems and, you know, do all the stuff that I do. That's part of my, part of my job as a, as a, you know, developer or QA person or, or what have you. And now virtualization has kind of, you know, has kind of been the buffer there, I think, that's helped here a lot, right? Because, you know, I can be the god of my own VM and I'm, I'm much more isolated. Uh, there than if I were on a physical machine. And IT has definitely kind of come a long way in terms of, hey, here's our, you know, here's our virtualization infrastructure. Come, come and get it. But there's still a gap there. You know? And this is normally where I would sort of launch into our product pitch, but I'm, I'm skipping all that stuff here because it doesn't seem appropriate for the audience. But I mean, the idea is basically you know, what you're getting out of IT is, is what I would sort of say is an empty box. You know, it's kind of like when, when the Dell box or the Sun box shows up on your loading dock. You know, you got to unpack it, you got to rack it up, power it up, configure it, and all that kind of stuff. So when the box showed up, it wasn't ready to be used. You know, you go through a whole configuration process to, to get there. It's the same with virtualization, you know. The, the, you, you can certainly try to have every single image that you will ever want, uh, you know, on hand or readily configurable through, through some of the, uh, the tools that we've, uh, we've heard about here. But, you know, at the same time, that isn't necessarily scalable. If, if those matrices of dependencies of configurations you know, are, 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 are so heinous, you really just need to do it on the fly, right? You really need, you, you need automation products and workflow products and integration with all of the virtualization and, and cloud infrastructures to, to configure all of that stuff on the fly because you can't really configure them all ahead of time. So, <clears throat> you know, kind of what you get out of the virtualization infrastructure, as I was just saying, is kind of the box, you know? You get a nicely configured VM. Maybe it has your tool set on it, maybe it doesn't. It certainly doesn't have the latest build you know, that you need to test now. You know, it, it may or may not know the IP address of the Oracle instance that you're about to spin up that the server's going to talk to. It may or may not know, you know, what, the, what client, you know, the clients may or may not know. So there's all this kind of, you know, orchestration that has to happen around taking a bunch of stuff out of the virtualization infrastructure. And, you know, when I say virtualization, you know, can sort of think cloud. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing. And, and have them know about each other, do something useful, capture the results, you know, move on and, and, and tear them down and do, do something else. So you really kind of, you know, you need to kind of get to the point where you, you can, as, as one of our customers says, you know, yeah, it's great. It takes me three minutes to get a VM set up, and then it takes me nine hours to get to the point where I can actually use it, you know. So, so it was really nice that the IT guy didn't have to unpack the hardware. You know, that, 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 that chore is kind of gone. But from the developer kind of side of the house, um, we're a little underserved, I would say, uh, by some of these products. Um, there's a lot out there now, so it's getting better, that's for sure. Um, and, and a lot of this, you know, and I have a couple of case studies that, that I'll talk about in a minute, you know, they actually, 
you know, again, it's the, hey, we bought, <laughs> we bought all these VMs and yet we're not using them. You know, we have, we have this huge, you know, all this virtual stuff that we bought and it's just kind of sitting there. You know, or do you have the opposite problem, which is I've got, you know, got 14,000 VM instances. I have no idea who's using them still. You know, so you have sort of the VM sprawl problem that you have to deal with uh, at some point. Kind of too much of a good thing. So you know, our, our pitch as a company is all around kind of managing this and how do you, you, know, how do you kind of take your dev organization and move it you know, into a cloud and into just sort of you know, a, a, an organization that's much more flexible in terms of where things run you know, and, and really kind of divorce that. But what I want to get into and talk a little bit about uh, here more is, is kind of just uh, go through some of these kind of case studies because I think there's some interesting just kind of data here on what some of these companies are, are, are doing and some of the advantages that they're get, getting out of moving things into the cloud. So um, Equinix is a, is a customer of ours. Um, you know, they had kind of, you know, they, they, they had the, the classic problem that I've just been describing, which was their IT department owned the virtualization inf infrastructure. So they're running all of these things that they're doing in dev on, 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 on a private cloud, essentially. Um, but even though they, and the quote is, that I put up there before about three minutes and nine hours is actually from one of the guys at, uh, at Equinix. And so the, the stuff that comes out of IT when they request, hey, I need, a, I need a VM, they're like, fine, boom, here it is. Then they have to install their tool chain, they have to you know, do all of this work to get it to be ready, and then they're gonna do something on it, and then you know, they kind of were getting stuck uh, and not getting very good uh, utilization out of, out of all of that. And then at the same time, all of their process are, uh, processes are manual, right? It's a guy sitting there for nine hours typing at a bash prompt, getting this thing configured. You know, maybe he's got a few scripts that he's written up <clears throat> or things like that, but it's essentially, you know, it screams out for all of the automation type stuff that obviously, um, you know, we talk about a lot at conferences like this. Um, but the, the, the key thing, and, and, and they came back to us, you know, a few months later and kind of said, look, here's, you know, here's how things have changed now that we're able to take advantage of this virtualization infrastructure and really automate it everything end to end. And that's what they've, they've, they've gone, you know, from being able to take what used to be a three hour process in terms of doing a deployment. You know, here's, a, you know here's, a, here's an app for a customer that we need to deploy in, we need to configure these many instances and wire them up this way and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they've taken that down from three hours to 30 minutes and it's automated, you know, so it's not three hours of somebody working, it's, push the button, come back in 30 minutes, make sure it worked, you know, which is, which is for them, you know, just from a cost savings is, is, is huge. Um, and, and from the IT kind of perspective in terms of the, the amount of work that they have to do on behalf of uh, the developers to install, you know, tool chains and all of those kinds of things, they've automated all that as well. So it's gone from, you know, the, the latency from, hey, I need this kind of environment set up has gone from, you know, days down to, you know, at this point, hours. Um, and that's the kind of real, you know, savings that, 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 you know, companies are getting, their organizations are getting when they want to get it right. You know, when they understand, yeah, this, you know, the cloud thing, it's not, a, it's not a there. You know, we don't just pick up all the stuff and throw it into the cloud and boom, it works automatically. Like, it would be nice, but that's just not how it works. You know, cloud, doing stuff in the cloud is, is much more complicated. Automation, you got to think about storage, you know, all of those kinds of things. But once you get it in there, um, you're, you're, you're in a much, much better spot. Uh, another kind of interesting uh, case study is Morgan Stanley, um, who has, they, they, they built an internal kind of IT organization for their developers. And one of the things that, that they were suffering from is they've got thousands of developers in lots and lots and lots of small teams. And they tend to come and go and form and reform and you know, it seems like banks do a reorg every week just to you know, keep everybody on their toes. Um, and each team was maintaining its own infrastructure. So a few years ago, they kind of said, look, we, we got to stop doing that because it's too expensive. You know, we've got hardware out the wazoo. We've got nowhere to put it. It costs, you know, it's expensive to cool, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so they, they said, look, we're going we're gonna to centralize the infrastructure for all of this stuff and provide it as a service you know, to the rest of the company, same as we do with email, same as we do with you know, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you know, do that also as part of kind of virtualizing a lot of the infrastructure that they were, that they were working on. And, and they've actually, you know, in, in, in the end, I think have, you know, and they, uh, you know, the developers, this wasn't one of those things where, where somebody, you know, got to walk around with a stick and beat the developers over the head and say, you have to use our infrastructure. It was much more sort of, well, I have a bullhorn, you know, I can yell at you, but I can't really make you do anything. But they've actually managed to onboard, you know, several hundred of, of, of these teams to their central infrastructure. And as a result now, just kind of costs are, are very much under control 
And they're actually able to grow the number of teams that they're supporting without growing the headcount in the IT department because they've, you know, they've basically automated so much of this now. Um, and, and now have kind of a shared infrastructure where teams that aren't necessarily, you know, the, you know different teams that are working not necessarily together but that, de that depend on each other now have visibility into what the other team is doing. You know, I'm, I know I'm waiting for a code drop from these guys next month. How are they doing? Let me, you know, let me go check. You know, so the fact that, that there's now visibility into all of the processes because it's running in this you know, shared facility that you can, you, know, you can grant access to anyone to see anybody else's stuff um, is, is, helps with the visibility and, the, and, and sort of gives everybody the heads up on, on, on what's coming down the pike. Uh, RIM's another interesting kind of story. They're, they're, uh, you know, if, you, if you think about being a cell phone manufacturer, and I certainly wouldn't want to be in RIM's shoes these days, but you know, you're, you're dealing with tons of different configurations, right? You've got chipsets, you've got phones, you've got you know, baseband you've got to deal with, and then you've got several customers that you've got to ship all this stuff to. So they're, they're, they're compl you know, sort of the complexity matrix of their, of their configuration system is, is pretty heinous. You know? And you don't want to ever you know, ship phone company X's logo on a phone that's you know, going to phone company Y. That would be bad. And yet, at some point, there's a person sitting there typing in the right arguments to a script to make sure that the correct build gets done for an image that goes on a phone that gets you know, drop shipped directly to a customer, right, with a Verizon logo on it or, or something like that. So, you know, being able to automate all of those things and then at the same time have enough capacity by moving this thing into, you know, using virtualization and, and having more, uh, you know, more of a, more of a cloud back end for it has allowed them to, you know, kind of uh, get much more, uh, you know, they sleep much better at night now, uh, knowing that they've got better sort of configuration management on top of all these things and, and are able to sort of, you know, speed up their processes so they're able to turn the crank much more often, which you know, is part of their effort to become more of an agile software organization has helped them quite, quite a bit. You know, if, you think about, you know, if you think about continuous integration you know, and then if you think about continuous testing, you know, continuous deployment, those kinds of things, if, if any of those things aren't automated or take a long time or are error prone or flaky, then, then your ability to be an agile software organization is pretty much you know, goes out the window. And, and that, you know, competitively, that, that hurts a lot. So a lot of these uh, companies are, are, are kind of going after it just on that basis alone. Um, E-College is, is, is an interesting, um, you know, interesting kind of E-Company e that are out there. They do uh, uh, learning applications and, and those kinds of things for, uh, for, for, um, for other schools and, and for uh, uh, online colleges and things like that. And they, they you know, they kind of had a, a very manual process. So all of, you know, all of their product is online. So, so this is web apps, you know, kind of up the wazoo. And, and yet they had a very, very manual process for, you know, how do I test my new web app? How do I test this patch? How do I test this bug fix? How do I get this from, you know, my desktop into a pre-production environment, into a prod environment? You know, those, those, those types of uh, transitions were highly manual, you know, and with ticketing systems. And I've decided now, whenever I see a ticketing system, that automatically means there's a manual process somewhere that needs to be, that needs to be automated. You know, if, if anybody ever says, well, I got to submit a ticket, that means you have a manual process. So get rid of that ticketing system and instead replace it with something that does the thing that you put the ticket in for. You know, it, it, it's idiotic to have somebody, you know, go to lunch and then, you know, come back and there's been a ticket sitting in their inbox for two hours asking for something to be deployed. You know, automate it, right? Um, and I think that's one of the key messages that people take away once they, <clears throat> once they start to think about cloud as a how and not a, not a where or a what. You know, which is it's about automating your processes so that you can take the thing that you do manually today once or twice and do it not just once or twice a day, but hundreds of times a day and, and do it correctly every single time. And, and that's very different than, than anything else that a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of companies have ever thought about because a lot of the stuff is still done manually. Even at very you know, kind of high end, you would think sort of sophisticated companies, just crazy stuff that's, that's all very manual uh, and, and, and things like that. Another, uh, you know, another kind of interesting case study at, at Ericsson. Um, I forget which Ericsson this is. There are so many of them, but um, uh, you know, they they they're kind of in a similar scenario as 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 with Morgan Stanley in that they have thousands of developers and th thousands of groups, you know, working on all all these different things. And the the infrastructure, um, you know, of each team having their own infrastructure just was was burdening them not just with kind of cost, but also just maintenance and you know, all, the, all the, 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 the upkeep of all that kind of stuff. So they wanted to move everything, you know, basically into virtualized data centers and have a smaller number of 
of data centers for the entire kind of global organization, but that people could, you know, people could use. And again, you know, they have the, they have the bullhorn, uh, not the stick. So they have to, you know, they kind of have to offer something up uh, to all these development organizations to, to sort of give up a little bit of control, you know, right, to, to kind of go away from, you know, all my servers that are sitting under my desk or all the servers that are in my, you know, closet to the server that's, you know, halfway across town in, in some data center that I'll never be able to get into, you know. And, and kind of what they, what they get in return for that is, look, we're going to, you know, you're, you'll be able to parallelize your builds, you'll be able to run your processes faster, you know, all these things will, will happen and, and be, uh, be a lot faster. And they're actually getting good uptake because of that. So you, you, it's kind of a carrot and stick approach, you know, when, when you're dealing with, with, uh, with, with developers. And, and, you know, being a software developer myself, I kind of I know that. So that's all I have uh, prepared. If there's anybody that uh, has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, there's probably cold beers in everybody's future, very nearly. Have you integrated this or had any, had any customers integrated this with Optimism? Um, the honest answer to that question is I don't know. Um, I know that we have customers who do use Puppet. Um, I think the, um, some of our Wall Street customers are starting to look into that because they've been kind of burned by a lot of the commercial tools that are out there for doing that kind of stuff. Um, but they also move very slowly. Um, you know, the way, the way we think about it from our perspective is that, is that Puppet's something that's out there that's, that, that can help drive all of the types of things that, that uh, um, you know, whether it's deployment or development or automation of anything, basically. So it's another. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the most obvious ones, you know, that we do sort of out of the box are with all the, the back-end virtualization infrastructures, you know, VMware, Lab Manager, Hyper-V, all of those kinds of things. There are, um, you know, typically what we end up doing is ourselves is lots of point integrations to point tools. So integrations to, you know, uh, you know Mercury testing tools or to, you know, uh, those kinds of things and trying to tie, kind of be the glue that takes all of these point solutions and, and, and glues them together. Because that's the other thing that kind of people are, and I don't know if this is more true with developers than it is with the rest of the world, but I, I certainly don't like to buy a suite of stuff where I know that, you know, of the 10 things in that bucket, eight of them are complete crap, but they had to fill out a slice in some, you know, pie diagram, and there's two of them that are good. And so a lot of organizations have, you know, stuff they've built themselves, you know, either because they, they couldn't find what they, you know, wanted off the shelf or there was no open source thing for it. So that's always something that you have to deal with. And that's one of the things that, you know, kind of in our, in our products, we always assume that we're going to have to integrate with, with homegrown stuff. Because, you, you know, we never walk into an organization and they say, help, we've never built our software, help us do our first build, right? I mean, it's, you know, we're typically dealing with people, you know, with customers that have a dozen people whose job it is to do nothing but crank out builds all day long. Um, so, so, you know, I'd, I'd say at this point, we've done, you know, 100 integrations with all kinds of different, you know, point tools, tiny little things, all the way up to you know, the, the virtualization type vendors. We're starting to see more and more um, interest and in, in, in kind of real things happening around the deploy aspect of things. So there's, you know, there's, there's a couple of startups that have, that, have, uh, um, you know, that have gotten started in the last couple of years that are kind of coming out and trying to, you know, trying to compete with Blade Logics and trying to, you know, trying to compete with you know, all kinds of other stuff that's out there, including the open source. So we're, we're fairly agnostic. We'll, we'll integrate with anyone at least once just to see if it's fun. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah. All right. You're the few, the proud. You stuck it out. <laughs> <laughs> now go home or wherever. <laughs>